Our next speaker is uh, Mateus uh, Gimares, and uh, Mateus began his career over 20 years ago as a junior video game programmer when C++, C++ C++ still ruled <laughs> the world and HTML was an extra credit class. Um, <laughs> married to code and architecture, uh, he maintained a hands-on approach through his journey from developer to CTO and everything else in between. Mateus uh, reminds every uh, patient about uh, the role that technology plays in uh, bridging the present with uh, all possible uh, possibilities for our future. So Matthias will talk about uh, several less uh, microservice patterns. Really interesting topic. Don't forget to share your questions. And uh, yeah, we are Hello. waiting. There. Can you hear me? Yeah, awesome. Hi, how are you? Hello, I'm very good. And you? Uh, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for joining. And uh, stay, stay. Yeah, is yours. So please go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Now, this is a bit uh, weird because I can't see everyone and I can hear you. So I'm just going to have to imagine you here because I usually like to feel the energy from the audience. So I hope you're all enjoying your day. I hope you're all enjoying the session and I hope you're all enjoying here. So thank you for being here, whoever's watching. And uh, most of all, thank you for having me here. I'm very honored and very um, excited uh, to be speaking at this uh, event. So we're going to be talking about server smart service patterns. And um, uh, I, I created this talk specifically for this event. So I haven't had much time to think of a creative, a more creative title. So it's very literal, service smart service patterns. Um, and really what it is, it's a, a, it will be a quick tour through hand-picked microservice patterns that I picked, uh, three of them specifically, um, that we can kind of have a look. And then I'm going to show you how you can uh, you could do this serverless in AWS with you know minimal effort to get you going. Now my name is Matthias Maris. I, I he already introduced me um, uh, very well there with my little life history there. So uh, I'm senior developer advocate for UK Ireland, and uh, yeah, I've always been very passionate about microservices from the beginning, even when it was just SOA before that, or even when I was just dealing with a lot of code and everything was procedural and you worried about modules and code libraries and functions and everything now has evolved of course to being more network a uh, fragmented which adds all kinds of uh additional thinking so what we're going to do like i said is look at three patterns today and the first one we're going to start with is source control now that can be very surprising because people don't think of source control as something you need to look into when you're reading a microservices book, for example, you're trying to wrap your hand around it. And that's because we take it for granted. We just think, well, I know how to store code. I've been doing it all my life. I, I don't need to know this, but when you get hands-on with it and you actually go, okay, let's create the first microservice. And then the second and the third, you start realizing that you get lots of questions about it uh, if you haven't prepped yourself properly for it. And the reason for that is because with microservices, the main thing you should always be thinking about is independence, 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 independence. That is your main criteria for all decisions. So whenever you're decision making, oh, should we do here? Should we do that? Should we do that? Think uh, how independent does that make a microservice? And that's a scale, right? That's a spectrum. You can never get everything 100% independent because it keeps changing. Technology keeps changing. Our needs, our demands keep changing. So you know, things keep getting interconnected more and more and you have to keep picking them apart. So um, you can never achieve 100% independence, but you should always be striving for it. That's the microservice ultimate goal, right? If you want to even oversimplify things. And that plays a role into source control. So let's see why. So we got three different uh, source control patterns here. We got monobuild, we got build per service, and we got repo per service. Now, uh, take note that these are my naming. I actually think there is a bit of a lack of common terminology in the space of source control. People call these patterns different things. They may call it similar to me or a little bit different, or totally different, or they don't even give names to it sometimes. They just do this, you know, and then they have long explanations for how they do source control. So I'm sticking a name here. Maybe you'll catch on, maybe you won't, but, you know, I think uh, they make sense. 
let's start by exploring a uh, mono build. So mono build, the main characteristic here is that we have one build, one big blocky uh, build here um, that will build everything. That's the main characteristic of this. But of course, we also got mono repo. So one repository for everything, all your microservices are gonna be in this repository. And we got mono package, as I call it, uh, just the one package with all the microservices. So mono, 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 mono. Everything is mono, pretty much. That could be the name of this pattern. Everything is mono. Um, the advantage of this is that it's super simple. Obviously, everything is in one place. So very easy for you to just pull your code and then, you know, what I'm calling that one pull and I'm all up, up to date. Great, don't have to do anything else. But there's a flip side of that, which means that one pull and you may be staying up late because obviously the, uh, the time to download that code is directly proportional to how much code there is because everything is in one place. But even worse than that is the build time because also your build time will be directly proportional to how much code you have because everything is just one big blob that you're building, right? And I remember early 2000s, um, you know, uh, a lot of the development teams I was in, we constantly talked about, oh, we need to reduce the build time. We need to reduce the build time. You know, it was like a, a, a concern. And what's funny about it, that nobody thought of breaking things up, you know, embrace distributed architecture, you know, embrace SOA and, you know, what would future um, in the future will be more um, known as microservices uh, as we know now. So. Um, we just kept trying to optimize the build uh, because it was a mono build. Everything's being built there. So obviously it's just gonna keep getting more and more time consuming. Now, the one other upside of this is that code is really easy to reuse. And that's great, right? If you know your dry principles, don't repeat yourself. We want to reuse code as much as possible. So fantastic, we get to reuse code very easily, but also, that is something to be careful with because remember the rule, you always want to keep going to independence, independence, independence. That's what should be in your head when you're uh, building microservices. And if you're reusing code very easily, that potentially means that you are creating dependencies all over the place because you just, without thinking, you know, uh, reusing this code project, like if you're in .NET, you've got a solution, but your projects, oh, it's easy, I'll just reference that project boom you know i can use it so you got to be very careful because you may be betraying the very thing that you set you know your journey towards so in general not my recommendation i wouldn't recommend this to you with my experience plenty of people may do this and if you do this and it works for you great but it's not scalable and in this world especially when we're talking about cloud um development and all that one of the main advantages is scalability. And even if you think you're not gonna need scale, think like the Flipbird guy that created that game that he thought was just a fun project and all of a sudden he became a multimillionaire from it and even retired the project because he said it brought too much stress to him because he didn't set up the application to be that successful, but it was. So, you know, just set up yourself for success. If it's a playground project, then fine. It's just playground. I don't care about source control. When I get to it, it's going to be completely different. So th in that case, sure, do a POC like that so you can focus on what matters or do, you know, playground projects, as I call them. But I wouldn't seriously consider this for a production setup. Now, what's the next step up from it? The step up from it will be build per service. And as you can see here, we still got mono repo. So you're still gonna share the same kind of benefits that the um, mono uh, build has. You're gonna get everything in one place, so it's simple. You do one pool and you're up to date. Also, one pool, you may be staying up late. Code is super easy to use. Again, we already covered, that could be a problem um, in the microservices architecture thinking. But one thing that's really good is that we started working towards that independence, you know, start walking that independence uh, journey and that uh, scale. So it's already a lot more independent when you use build per service, because as the name implied, we are building, um, we're doing one build per service. And one thing from the other one that I forgot to mention, but just as good here in context, is that when you're doing mono build, the main problem is that one little change and you are building everything, right? So even if I updated one variable name on the customer service in the mono build, 
literally everything else gets built. The basket service, the order service, everything is built just by changing one variable name in one service. In this case here, in the build per service, that won't happen. If I change one variable name in the customer service, that only the customer service will be built. And then we're gonna have a package per service, which means that we're only gonna have a package for the customer service, which gives us, again, degrees of independence so we can deploy that independently from the other ones. It's just a variable change. So I can deploy that customer service at any time. Nothing's gonna be affected by it. Or maybe it will, depending on what the variable is doing, if it's really evil. Um, and the way you're gonna do that build per service is simply by picking out folders, very easy. So customer service lives on the customer folder, basket service, basket folder. A change in the basket uh, folder triggers basket service build, triggers uh, basket service package, and then you can go and deploy it. Very, very good, right, already. Much better than the, the previous one. Um, the main thing here, the main downside is, uh, well, this is a main one, but it's a big one, complex build. And uh, whilst the next one, which you're probably getting the feel is my favorite one that I'm gonna recommend to you, also potentially could have complex builds, depending on what you're doing. This one is the most complex one because um, you are now gonna have to deal with different conditions in different, um, um, say, uh, work streams of folder changes. When something triggers a build, when it doesn't, when it triggers two builds because it changed two places and all kinds of things. You have to configure this really well and you have to keep up with it really well. And um, a lot of people say, yeah, but many companies do mono um, build per service uh, pattern and you know they do just fine and they're huge companies. There are some famous huge companies that do this that people argue in these conversations. But the thing is, you're not necessarily one of those huge companies. And I argue that even if you are and you have thousands of developers to throw at it and create custom build engines, custom tools, you know, you're pretty much serving yourself. Um, and all those thousands of developers could just be doing other things with the time, you know, other innovation, you know, creating innovative things and not really just um, doing all the stuff to serve a uh, a build, you know, a system. So I still think it's a bit of a waste of time, not my recommended pattern, but it can work for you. Of course it can. It works for some companies as well. And here's my recommendation. Repo per service, very straightforward in name, in concept, in everything. You have one repository per service. Um, the only downside of this is that you can really, well, no, there are two here. Uh, you, you can have complex builds, but at the same time, by default, your build is going to be very simple. The complexity of your build will only depend on what the microservice needs to do. Um, but everything is within the scope of the service. So in theory, it's very easy. You're kind of going back to the benefits of the mono build. The repository is very easy. The pool is very easy. You just do one pool, you got everything you need if you're looking after the service. Uh, the build will be fast because it's just for that one service. And you got one package per service, which means you got independence all over the place. Very independent, very good for microservices. Um, the thing is, is that the code we use becomes complex. And this is where, you know, source control plays a role into making sure that your microservices patterns are still being obeyed. And this is the surprising factor because you don't realize this until you actually start coding and go, oh, but how do I use that domain object that's over there? Oh, do I need a share library? Do I put a, a share library into my microservices? What happens if I update the library? Now, you know, do I have to release them together? So it's a whole talk in itself. So code reuse is tricky and you can help yourself um, by, uh, by offsetting your source control to make it easy, but then you have other side effects. So my, um, my recommendation is using repo per service and that will strap yourself up for success, you know, and familiarity with scalable source control for microservices. And, uh, and then you're going to also have to learn about the code reuse responsibly, which is not a bad thing. The only, only, the only other thing here is the holistic view. It becomes really hard for you to see what everything that's going on. So with the mono build and the build per service, you can very easily see the whole source code and, you know, get a feel for the whole system. Um, so yeah, it's harder to piece the, uh, to pull the pieces together. There are tools, there are many things that you can do for this. But then the question is why? Why do you need to keep looking at the whole thing all the time? You should have, your teams should have ownership over your microservices. So if you find yourself constantly gravitating to, oh, I must see 
how everything is doing in unison, maybe you need to adjust the monolithic thinking. Maybe there's more to it. Um, so I think my re personal recommendation to you is, based on my experience, is to use the Ripple per service pattern. Let's see how this looks on AWS if you're going to do this serverlessly. And the good uh, news is that um, our CI, CD, um, building blocks are serverless. You just need to use them. You need to come on to AWS, sign up, and then start using our building blocks. And the main hero there is Code Pipeline, which is orchestrator or CI, CD things. And, um, and then we got building blocks to do each step of the way. So we got code build that builds your um, your code, runs unit tests or whatever you need to do. Code deploy, which will target uh, platforms such as uh, deploying on Lambda, deploying on um, Elastic Container Service, Elastic Compute Service, all kinds of things. So you can put these building blocks together to create this, the CI CD pipeline that you need. And it can be as simple as this, or it can be as complex as this. And this is an enterprise CI CD pipeline. However, even though it looks intimidating at first, if you don't have workloads of the size, you can potentially pick out you know, uh, certain icons here that look similar. Like look, code pipeline, code pipeline, code commit, code commit over here, code build. So at AWS, we give you building blocks and you can just use it to compose uh, whatever you need to whatever scalability. Once you learn it, it becomes easier to put them together in different ways. And uh, that's why I recommend you actually check our code pipeline tutorials. We have a lot of different use cases, different things that you can use there um, to, to practice. Some of them you can even do in an afternoon. Really fun if you're geeky like me. Um, so, you know, you could just be uh, doing that and then start figuring out how you can put these parts together and get really good at it. Learn by doing, right? Get your hands dirty. Best way to do it. Cool. Let's move on to the second pattern. And the second pattern is the strangler pattern. Now, this one's a little bit more uh, microservice-y. If you have uh, talked about microservices with anyone before, most likely you ran into strangler pattern. Strangler pattern was devised by the genius called Martin Fowler. Uh, I was gonna say many years ago, but actually it's probably decades now. <laughs> oh my God, time is flying. Um, and the strangler pattern is all about application migration. So, uh, it's about helping you migrate from the monolithic uh, patterns to microservices. But most importantly, it's helping you do that slowly, slowly but surely. My strangler pattern is all about not boiling the ocean and giving you starting points because it's very hard to know where to start, right? It's like writing a book. Where do I begin from? Um, and so it became very popular because it's proved itself very useful for workloads of so many different sizes. Um, so let's have a quick look at what this looks like. So uh, we're going to look at these uh, services, and they don't exist yet, so we're going to create them as we need them. Um, and we have in the middle here a big monolith full of code, and they're so tangled together. And we're going to unpick this, and it starts separated out. The objective, to make sure that the monolith is empty. It's got nothing inside, no soul, so we can destroy it. So we can strangle it. And that all we have is the uh, microservices around it in a beautiful, uh, shiny, modern application. So let's see how this looks like. And by the way, the way I like to see uh, this, like the composition exercise, which is what the strangler panel is helping you with, um, is um, there is this game, which I played when I was a kid in Brazil. And I don't know if it's uh, famous in the world, but it's a, a sticks game. I'm not sure what it would be called in English. And you have like a bunch of colored sticks and you put it on a table to go, and then they're all kind of scattered on the table. And then each player has a stick and they have to pick the stick from that pile without moving the other ones. So you have to very sharply go flick like that. And then, you know, you, the, you get the stick and you get to keep it. And whoever has the most sticks in the end win. So it's very similar in that you want to pick things that are not rattling everything else around it too much. Right. Um, and uh, what in English would say the low hanging fruit, right? The easiest things, because that will give you familiarity. That will, that, that will get you on a learning curve. You're going to learn things. And then, you know, you're going to structure teams and all that kind of stuff. You're going to prove business value, most importantly. So you get sponsorship from the business because they don't care about all this. What they care about is like, uh, is our product better? Is our processes faster? You know, are we more efficient? So you need to keep proving that business value as you go. That's what the Strangler Pattern is all about, helping you pick the things slowly and then uh, eventually you're done. 
So we could begin, for example, picking the get customer details call. Seems easy enough. So we can create the customer service that, pick, uh, that uh, gets us on that learning curve to create microservices, decide on source control patterns and all that kind of stuff. And it's a read-only operation. So it seems easy enough. Uh, let's do that. All we need to do is move the database, move some code, and then we're going to get details returned from a service and continue the code as normal. Okay, great. Well, now we know what to do that. Why don't we pick get best uh, details next? It's a read-only operation. We need to create a microservice. Ah, everything's looking a bit familiar. Great, feeling good about it. So next, let's check stock. So let's create the inventory service. Let's work with numbers a little bit and um, let's um, start uh, seeing if we can do maybe a little bit of uh, interplay between these different services, okay? Now, next, let's get delivery options. Read only operation, create another service, bada bing, bada boom. We're nailing this, right. Now we need to calculate delivery costs. Uh, this is the first time we're gonna start dealing more with algorithms. How do we bring algorithms into um, a microservice? How are we gonna make sure that they all, um, the domain that they deal with is all nicely encapsulated in this microservice? No leaky abstractions, uh, independence factor and all that. So this is gonna set us in that learning curve. Cool. Then we're going to uh, reserve stock. Ooh, our first write operation. So now we're not just going to read, we're actually going to write. Potentially, we've already learned how to do some writes in the calculate delivery costs there. So we can also, you know, transfer some lessons here. And also reserve stock is definitely an interplay between different services because if we're reserving stock, most likely we had an order, right? So it's going to get you into patterns about communication between services and whatnot. Then we're going to calculate subtotal. Oh, numbers again. Okay, that one seems easy enough. We know how to do that. Then we're going to calculate tax. And at this point, you may think, hmm, should we not have a tax service? And the answer is maybe, but it's much easier for you to decompose things than for you to assemble things together again, right? So what I would say is, if you're only shipping nationally, for example, your tax should be quite easy. So maybe leave it there on the basket service. As you start complicating things, shipping internationally, maybe let's create a tech service at that point and then figure out the communication between them. It's much easier to do that and actually a very typical journey. So for now, it goes there. Then we're gonna calculate total. Great, we create the order service. Well, we probably already created the order service before that, to be honest, anyway, if you reserve stock. But, you know, this is just a simple um, uh, talk. Then we create the payment service and we take payment. And then we're gonna complete the order. Now complete the order really is where orchestration comes in because if you're completing the order, that means we probably are talking to the warehouse, we talk to the inventory service, we sorted our delivery costs, our delivery um, reservations, uh, all kinds of things, right? So this is uh, uh, completing the order is a huge exercise in communication patterns here. And then we're gonna email the receipt, in which case we may go, oh, should we need an email service? Don't other things need email? Well, same thought as a tech service. We already been through that. Let's put it there and we'll decide it later because we can always decompose more later. And guess what? The monolith is empty. It's an empty shell, which no one cares for anymore. So we can get rid of it and we can just uh, have UI code. That's all we need. UI that is talking to microservices and uh, for their logic and uh, for doing domain operations and everything else. So it's what in English, you know, it's that easy does it. Slowly but surely. We go slowly, we prove value along the way, we are improving the application along the way. So this is real work, not just PLCs, but we're taking our time. The thing is, of course, I'm oversimplifying because you may wonder what's happening in code. Like how does the code know that there is a new microservice? Surely I'm touching my monolith all over the place and this can be complicated, yes. but. The way that you simplify this is by having what's called interceptors. And this could be a fancy word for something like an if statement to something a little bit more involved as we're gonna see in a second. Um, and the concept is very simple. So for example, let's uh, migrate get customer details, right? Um, and make this into more modern application patterns away from a monolith. Okay, so what we're gonna do is go on the code and let's stick to the easy one right now and go if, what you're trying to do is get a uh, customer detail. So you're trying to get a customer name. That's great because we already migrated that to a customer uh, microservice and we can make that call. So the code is gonna be directed to making that call to the microservice, 
getting the response and continue on from there as normal. You don't need to touch the rest, right? But let's say you want uh, the collection of addresses for that customer. Ooh, we haven't migrated that yet. Most of the time, because if you are watching the previous talk, database concerns, because database is harder to migrate, right? And harder to unpick, especially if you had a, a monolithic relational database. So we haven't migrated that yet. So the code is gonna go, Never mind. go to that function that already exists on the monolith and run that horrendous static inline uh, SQL query that uh, does this and brings back the customer address directly from our on-premise on Oracle database, for example. So this is how you do it. You just use interceptors in your code and then on the service layer to direct stuff around as you strangle your monolith. A little bit more complicated would be if you actually um, want to start strangling the monolith from the service perspective, instead of just having code that is redirecting it. Maybe we can be a little bit more smart about it. We can put a uh, facade in front of a monolith, redirect all user traffic to go, hey, if you go forward slash monolith, we serve it from the monolith. If you go forward slash anything else, then you're going to a microservice, for example. So let's have a, a quick look at how that could look like in AWS using serverless technology. So if you're gonna do the string on AWS using serverless, first thing you're gonna do is you need to sever that link between your user and your on-premise system, your monolith, right? So let's sever that, separate it out, and in the middle, we're gonna put AWS Cloud. And then in AWS, uh, if you work with AWS, you already know that you have to pick a region. So we pick our region. Um, in my case, for example, I may pick EU West uh, 1, which is Ireland. So everything is going to be in that region. And then in that region, I'm going to put the Strangler Pattern Hero here, API Gateway, Amazon API Gateway. And through API Gateway, the intention here is that we're going to make calls to forward slash monolith, and that's always going to redirect to our monolith on premise. So we need to do that first before doing anything else, because otherwise users are going to connect to our API Gateway and go nowhere. So let's take care of this side of the equation. And this side of the equation can look a little bit complicated if you're not very familiar uh, with AWS concepts. So I'm gonna show you, but um, there are many resources that you can use to uh, dive deeper into this. And it's simpler than it seems at first if you're not familiar with these concepts. The way you connect your monolith with, uh, well, your monolith, your on-premise system with AWS is via Direct Connect. And Direct Connect is a dedicated line between your on-premise systems and AWS. Great. Now, you could also do this with VPN, AWS Site-to-Site -Site VPN, to be more exact. And um, the difference here is that with Direct Connect, you've got a dedicated line, and your latency will be a lot better. So the recommended approach would be Direct Connect, but it surely it will work with VPN as well. Then we are going to add a what's called customer gateway on our network on premise. And that is just the entry point, right? The doorway to AWS that Direct Connect is going to use to connect to um, and through inbound and outbound traffic. Okay. Now we just need to take care of this side of the equation. How does Direct Connect connect to AWS? And this is the bit that's a little bit involved. So we need to create a VPC, virtual private cloud, which is you pretty much your little network inside AWS. Much like you got a network on-premise, you have a little network inside AWS. And we need to add a doorway, much like we had the customer gateway. And that's our VPN gateway. That's how we will communicate with things. Inside our VPC, we're gonna add two, um, well, we're gonna choose two av availability zones where we're going to add two private subnets. If you're not network wizard, don't worry. All this means is that it, this is highly available. We have two separate locations as a physical locations in the world that if some natural disaster happens, the other one can take over and you know, promoting high availability of your system. That's what availability zones are helping you with here. That's why we got two of them. And the private subnet obviously is just our internal network that it's not out on the internet. We don't want people to connect to this. It's on our little infrastructure to connect AWS with our monolith on premise. It's just a tunnel. So, there, we're going to um, deploy a network load balancer. And this is the, the, the link between this uh, networking infrastructure and the VPN gateway, which is our doorway to our monolith. And then all we need to do is connect our API gateway to the network load balancer. And you do that what's called a VPC link because you're going into your VPC from API gateway. And it's going to do that every time you go forward slash monolith. So every time you go forward slash monolith, Taking from here, the user is going to call API Gateway. API Gateway is going to go, oh, 
we're calling this on your on-premise monolith because this hasn't been migrated anywhere else. Fantastic. So let me use the VPC link with, to get through into that uh, private network that you have set up. I'm going to talk to the network load balancer. The network load balancer is going to go, mm, OK, I'm going to forward this tra uh, traffic to VPN gateway. VPN gateway is going to go, oh, do, 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 do. I found my tunnel through Direct Connect. This is the line that I'm using. And that's going to get to customer gateway and give it to your systems. Done. We connected the monolith. Now we want to start strangling it. We want to go, oh, you know what? Uh, I'm going to get customer details and we're going to migrate that first. I'm going to create a Lambda for that. Fantastic. Now, guess what? The hard part is done. All you need to do is create a Lambda and then go, if my user requests get customer details, then serve it from Lambda. Don't even go to the monolith. So API Gateway here is effectively acting as the strangler, right? And eventually, once you've got loads of these, then if you will have no need for this big thing here anymore. And you don't need to just use Lambda. You can use other things like the Amazon Elastic Container Service if you have containerized your application, something that is very good to do. But that's a subject for a whole other talk as well. Um, but to do that, you could use, for example, Amazon, uh, Amazon Elastic Container Service which is also deployed on that network infrastructure that we mentioned. As you can see, much like with the CICD, once you learn these things, they start repeating themselves. We have a network load balancer, we have a VPC link, and all we need to do is say API gateway. If anybody goes to payment history, then we are gonna uh, connect to this microservice, which it has um, all the logic for payment history, which can take a while to run. So we're using ECS instead of Lambda, because Lambda can only process up to 15 minutes. And then everything else works the same, so on and so forth. So this is how you can do Strangler on AWS. Now, the good news is that if you're using .NET, we just launched something amazing last year, and that is the microservice um, service extractor for .NET. So I'll show you that next. But before I do, I just want to say that also you can enhance the solution and once it's on AWS with so many other things, building blocks I mentioned before, that can start attaching to your solution. So you could, for example, add the AWS Web Application Firewall, um, where uh, it's going to pick out OWASP rules and web application security rules to really up the security posture. And while you're at it, you could use Guard Duty. Again, up your security posture. Things that will be really hard to do on your on premise system without actually procuring hardware and all that kind of stuff. This is the power of serverless. You can just get a lot of functionality simply by starting to use things. And once they're on AWS, very easy to connect the dots. You could also use X-Ray for visibility and correlation. That means you give a correlation ID to your request and you know exactly the journey they're taking all the way if they're going to the monolith, if they're coming locally to the get customer details, what's happening. And then you can use CloudWatch for logs and CloudTrail for logging what's happening in your AWS accounts themselves. So for example, if you created Amazon API Gateway, it will be there in the log somebody created an API, API Gateway instance, right? And that's how you bring it all together. Now, as I was mentioning, there is actually uh, something very cool we launched last year for .NET, where you don't even have to do any of that, although you can still use those augmentations at the WAF and everything else once everything is done, because all, all this is doing is helping you with the strangler pattern. So it's giving you a tool for the strangler pattern and it scans your .NET code base and then it will give you a visualization of everything that's happening in your monolith code. And it will give you a not only static analysis, but also runtime analysis. It's gonna kind of simulate behind the scenes like, oh, how would this run? And then actually show you everything that's connecting or calling each other. So you see where things are busy. And then it will actually do the repo per service pattern that I was talking about, the source control pattern for you. It will identify uh, code elements and components and then uh, refactor them into their own code bases. So you end up with a very robust, scalable repo per service pattern. And then you can take it from there. So very cool. If you've got .NET applications, I really recommend you uh, give this a go and explore it. Um, so last, because I'm cautious of time, I'm going to go straight into it, uh, is transactions. This is like one of my favorite ones. And this is not just one talk, but a thousand talks on itself. Um, and transactions are a very cool subject matters because I like to think of them as almost an all lessons apply type of subject. Um, it touches on so many things. Um, but of course, in this talk, we can only focus on one thing, 
and I'm gonna focus on the concept of atomicity. For those that are not very familiar with transactions, uh, when we talk transactions, we talk about asset transactions. That's the mainstream thing. It's like almost one and the same um, uh, in this day and age because asset transactions is what we used to. It's what's been powering all these digital systems, you know, since ancient times. Oh, it's not that long ago. If you think about it, the internet was only born in the 90s. Um, but um, the concept of asset is that you got uh, four factors to make sure that a transaction is transactional, and that is atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Um, I'm not going to uh, go into each one of them. So, of course, each one of them spawns so many different patterns that we could talk about in terms of microservices. Um, but today I'm going to focus on atomicity. And atomicity means that you do everything together. It's the thing that most people think about when they think transactions. And in fact, uh, people that are not having been exposed to asset before, they kind of struggle to understand what the other ones kind of mean because everybody just thinks transactions is atomicity. And that means doing everything at once or undoing everything at once. Either everything works or nothing works and that's that, right? So if you have an order that's about to be completed, you also want to reduce the stock at the same time, right? And we're gonna look a little bit about that now. But um, this is how it's been done for the longest time. You will have uh, asset transactions supported on local transactions, i.e. your own monolithic database systems, SQL databases, such as Oracle, SQL Server, Aurora, so many more. And, um, but also what's surprising to people is that no SQL databases are starting to support it as well. Neo4j supports asset transactions. Our own Amazon DynamoDB supports asset transactions. So you don't lose anything by moving away from SQL. It's not a SQL concept, but people are very used to thinking it is because we've been using SQL for the longest time. Um, but once we started moving away from monolithic databases, then we start going to distributed transactions. And distributed transactions, again, kind of became synonymous with two-phase commit, a, which is usually abbreviated as 2PC, right? Two-phase commit. And we're going to look a little bit into that. But now we have what I like to call, this is not really an industry term yet, <laughs> uh, uh, called fragmented transactions. So, and this is where we are today. And this is the recommended pattern when you're dealing with microservices, and you're gonna see why in a second. And the way you do that is with Saga, uh, which I find is very dramatic. I love the name, Saga. Um, you know, makes you wanna watch Star Wars. So we're gonna have a little, uh, a little look through each one of them so we understand the differences. So very quickly, starting with local transactions, uh, the way it works is you have your monolithic database and you have different tables. And then we have a transaction that does two things. One, it updates the orders table, it updates the inventory table. Okay, so the uh, this amazing database engineers that created that product for you have already baked in the logic to make sure that these changes are gonna happen at once. And uh, if it needs to be rolled back, they're gonna be rolled back at once as well. If you need to roll back, nobody is even gonna know this happened, right? It's like it never happened. So it's going to go ka -ching! If I had a sound effect, that's what it was said. I don't know if you can't call my animation there. I spent an unhealthy amount of time doing that. Uh, so you went minus one and we decreased the stock and then the is fulfilled um, field here turned to true all at the same time. And if you do that again, then ka -ching! Uh, then, you know, we have both orders are true and the stock is zero, fantastic. That's what we want, everything's kept in sync. Okay, cool. Let's go to distributed transactions. Well, distributed transactions is the one that most people think, well, uh, microservices is a distributed architecture, so surely this is the way. And while they may share, you know, they have the name match, I'm here to tell you that it's not. Distributed transaction is a terrible, terrible idea for your uh, microservices, and this is why. So with distributed transaction, what happens is now you have separate databases. In our case with microservices, even worse, you have separate network components. They may live in completely different parts of the world. And uh, not only your databases can go down, but your network connection can go down, your network connection can go down. The permutations and combinations of failure modes is, uh, I, I would risk say, almost infinite. There's so many things that you need to consider, right? And this is pretty much the problem because when, he, uh, because when it comes down to distributed transaction, it, because you're not, your transaction is not living in the same place, you need an external party to coordinate all this, what we call the coordinator. So the coordinator can only do so much and it's gonna do this in two phases. This is the two-phase commit. 
The first phase is the voting phase. It's going to ask each one of these things, can you do the change? So it's going to scan this transaction and go, okay, I need to update the orders table and the is fulfilled column, and I need to update inventory and stock. So it's going to ask each one of them, can I do it? Can I do it? They're both going to reply and say, yeah, sure, uh, go ahead. Um, and then we're going to go, great, I'm going to hold you to that promise. So I'm going to lock it. It's a very greedy uh, algorithm. I'm going to lock this because if you told me I can change, I don't want you to come back to me in five minutes and say, no, you cannot change. Sorry, it was lying. Um, so we're going to lock it. Of course, the moment you lock it, you have so many problems because uh, there are more orders coming in. And what are they going to do? They're going to have to wait. So you have to hope that this is very quick. And in this day and age, it probably is very quick most of the time if you're doing happy paths because everything, you know, compute processing and even network speed is ridiculously fast these days. But what will happen then if we go like we commit the transaction and then it's all good because our orders table is up and running. So it's going to change it. But then now we're going to do the um, commit on the um inventory table and then wham, 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 uh oh we lost connection to the microservice internet is down i don't know what's happening all we know is that this is taking two hours and nothing's happened well what do you think happened in those two hours uh you pretty much became a twitter hashtag that's what happened so um once those two hours are gone finally connection is going to be established and the coordinator is going to go yes i can do this it's going to commit the transaction and then it's going to do the change Ching! stock is zero now and then it's going to remove the logs finally now all your other millions of customers can go and um and do the place their orders so this is clearly a lot of hoping and wishing and praying that everything will be good forever not the most robust way to go about it so what is the most robust way to go about it sagas and sagas are as cool as they sound so with sagas we're going to remove the lock and we are going to take care of what's called referred to usually as long-lived transactions so it doesn't matter that this is microservices this theory believe it or not started in 1987. this is how visionary these people were but they were more concerned about uh splitting databases they didn't even anticipate splitting different network paths uh but it applies the same it applies really well to microservices and the thinking here is that we're going to um, split these transactions. If we go all the way to the end and everything is good, then great, right? We can have four, 10, 20 changes and it's all good. But what happens then if we're actually going along and it's all good, but then we get to change three and then, oh no, the dreaded two hour thing again, because it's the only clock icon I could find license to put on the presentation. So, okay, it's taking two hours. What are we going to do about it? Not good, right? So what we're going to do is split this transaction into sub-transactions, mini-transactions, micro-transactions, fragmented transactions, whatever you want to call it. And each transaction is going to take care of its own actions, of its own changes, right? And um, change one is going to be good. Change two is going to be great. Change three is fantastic. We're almost there. However, change four is meh, bzz, wrong, not working. So what are we going to do? Well, the main difference here for you to keep in mind is that with sagas, um that change happened so when we did uh, distributed transactions or local transactions if we had to roll back at the expense of all the craziness and chaos of logs um it was as if nothing ever happened because those fields were locked and then it's going to revert those changes and unlock it so it's going to look to the world like nothing happened this happened every single one of these transactions with the saga happened so what you need to do is change your thinking what you need to do is start doing compensating transactions with compensating actions inside. What does that mean? Well, transaction three, let's say, was take payment. So the compensating action of take payment is refund. Give your customer a refund. So it's not that payment never happened. It happened, but we're going to refund our customer and so on and so forth. We're going to keep rolling back by doing these compensating actions. And this takes a lot of thinking on your part because you really need to understand the business processes. And that is a great thing because when technology and development makes you think about your business processes, you got a winner, right? Because you, your code should be in your architecture and your panel should be serving the business and you know, the product that you're trying to release. 
So there are two ways of doing compensating actions. There's backward and there's forward. Uh, backward means uh, you know, more kind of the equivalent of a rollback, if you will. So we're gonna try to undo things, but undo is a word that I ban from saga conversations. If you're you know, in architectural meetings, trying to figure this out because you're not undoing anything. You, things have been done. You are compensating for them, right? Um, so you're gonna do backwards as in, okay, you got paid, we're gonna give you a refund. That's a backward uh, compensation action. But you may as well also go forward. Say, for example, you've done all these uh, actions in your transaction for an order, and then what happened is the delivery man dropped your super expensive vase right at your door uh, before he had a chance to even ring the doorbell. And he goes, oops, and then he doesn't say anything and go back. Is it worth reverting everything because of that? Or is it easier just to try again and send an email and say, hey, you know, sorry, cousin, we're gonna try uh, to deliver it tomorrow again. And that's the way it goes. My time is nearly up. So, um, and I am glad to say that I only got two more slides. So let me skip to the summary. So the lesson here is that, um, sorry, yes. we are on time. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, man. We are on fine. time. Yeah, uh, we need to stop uh, here uh, b before summary. I'm just would like to highlight that uh, first time I see that someone explained this book <laughs> in the 30 minutes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's Sam really Newman. Great. Love Sam yeah, Newman. Yeah. yeah. And you're right, Saga is a really uh, dramatic <laughs> name for this pattern. And uh, I'm a huge fan of Martin Fowler as well. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's really great, a lot of information, and uh, we just need to move forward. Sorry, but uh, before we go to break, I would like to ask you a few questions. Uh, just a quick one. Before yeah. we start in any patterns uh, like struggle or uh, sagas and such on or even think about microservices we should run some ddd um, exercise right so we should understand what this service mean for us for business people running some event storming do you have such i don't know experience in these workshops event storming workshops kind of like that yes Yes, and, and that's absolutely great advice. Event storming is something that's catching on. Some people haven't really heard of it, but it's really fun. And it, it kind of takes me back to the beginning times of Agile when people you know, were getting their heads around product management and how to put uh, stickers on the wall. Oh, that's the way we actually talk about product. You know, it brings the fun back into architecture. I would say not that you know, architecture is not fun, but that's just me. Um, so yes, event storming, it's, uh, yeah, we don't have much time, so I'm not gonna go too much into it, but it's something I really recommend at least people reading about, and it's just a way for you to uh, discover uh, how things are gonna communicate and really have that as your central piece, because again, you're driving towards independence. So the most important thing for you is to have uh, independent communication, because this is where things can go wrong. Your coupling can go wrong if you start calling things instead of just saying, hey, right. I'm an order service. I only care whether something happened. I don't care if delivery service exists. Who is that? You know, it's not my concern. And that's why event storm is going to help you with. That's right. Yeah. We have uh, a few more questions. If you can join to Pine and uh, answer on them, it would be awesome in Q&A section. Thank you for your time and to support Ukraine. I saw your cards in a sl one of the slides and uh, there was uh, blue and yellow, like <laughs> Ukrainian flag. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and cover, <laughs> no, yeah. It's my pleasure, my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Thank you for support.